built on Christ. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We're all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Welcome to our show. I'm Father Jacques, filling in for Mother Angelica this evening. And Jeff Kedens is here with me, and we're hosting three wonderful guests. And I hope that you enjoy this, uh, this sharing tonight. How are you doing, Jeff? Good. I'm doing wonderful. I've uh, never been better. Jeff was saying, uh, on the plane, what do you do? It's very interesting. Fly. Well, more than that. <laughs> no, I, um, when I'm on the airplane uh, coming here, I um, have my laptop, and I have an opportunity to answer all my email. And... Uh, all the email that comes in for the various shows, I get an opportunity to write little letters back, and so it's a productive time for me. It's really great, yeah. Tonight, uh, something very interesting. Our guests work in uh, grade school education from third grade to eighth grade. And since you have three children. I do. And the oldest is 16. She is, yep. And I, and I think that, uh, you know, spiritual formation of young people is like a matter of life or death, you know? If they don't get formed when they're young, you have to do all that catch-up work. I know uh, I'm a convert, and I really wasn't formed spiritually until um, maybe when I was 17, 16 or 17. And when you read the lives of the saints, you know, they were, like Therese was formed spiritually by her family. Or most of the people that are formed spiritually have a tremendous uh, head start over other people. So I think we'll have a very interesting uh, show tonight because spiritual formation at all ages is important. So please uh, open your hearts this evening to, I think we all have to be, in a sense, converted. You had something interesting to say about the, uh, what the Holy Father said, Jeff? I was reading earlier today, the Holy Father was, uh, in his address, was talking about this whole issue of formation of young people. And in Lublin, Por uh, Poland, uh, he has a tremendous program going on where there's about 150 young adults who are being formed for the purpose of evangelization, for the new evangelization. And he said today, and I, I love this quote, he said, whoever invests in man in his total development never loses. The fruits of this investment never perish. And uh, the Holy Father is challenging all of us to invest in people at a time uh, where there's a lot of talk in investing in finance and uh, all kinds of other things, the Holy Father is drawing us back to really what's important, and that is uh, investing in people. And I asked the question, why? And uh, it's because people are created in the image and likeness of mm -hmm. God. And when you think about it, Father, uh, what's going to live on for eternity? I mean, this piece of paper isn't, uh, the plants and so forth, uh, the rug, it's not, the cameras, but people will. People mm -hmm. will live for eternity. And so it's a prudent person that invests in people, and that's what our guests are coming out here. Uh, Father James will be joining us with uh, two beautiful sisters, and they're going to be talking about investing in, in young people. Stay with us. We'll be back in a minute. Thank you. several representatives from the Mercedarian Order this evening. Um, what's very interesting about this order, there's many branches of this order. We have Father James Mayer, who studied in Rome, got his license in Rome. He's been novice master, hospital chaplain, director of vocations, master. He does it all. <laughs> he does it all. <laughs> we have Sister Rosemary, and you live in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And Sister Rosemary is from Florida. And they all work with young people, and they seem to be very happy with their job. Oh, yes. <laughs> and Sister Maria of the Angels, uh, you're in? In Cleveland. In Cleveland, and... Oh, yeah. uh, but I am originally from Mexico City. Mexico City, and you, Sister, had been on the uh, General Ed Council for... Uh, for 18 years. 18 years, and you yes. traveled all over the world. 
and now you're teaching and you're kind of grounded and you're kind of teaching in a school that you love. You had to relearn everything, huh? I have to relearn after 19 years. But you seem very happy and joyful. I am so. very happy. They all love children. Well, I think we all love children, but it's different to work with them. I said third grade to eighth grade, but it's really third, um, three, years. three years old and to... We'd like to welcome you to our show this evening. And Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It would be Thank really uh, interesting. You guys are wonderful. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. <laughs> who would like to? Who would like to start? Thank you. Well, our, our order goes back almost eight centuries to 1218, where our founder Peter Nolasco, Saint Peter Nolasco was a merchant and he saw that the faith was so precious of a gift and it was being robbed by the, uh, the slavery induced by the Muslims at the time. And the Christians would have to uh, apostatize the Christian faith or they would be killed. So Peter Nolasco with his band of friends uh, began this work and then through the inspiration of the Virgin Mary, they consecrated themselves to God and this order began. Wasn't that awful dangerous? Well, many of our friars uh, over the centuries have been martyred, and uh, we didn't have enough money to ransom with the Muslims, so we give ourselves. And that's our fourth vow, the fourth vow, to give ourselves, if necessary, for the freedom of Christians. Now, what about the Blessed Mother? Did she, uh, uh, in relation to Our Lady of Mercy, did he have any visions, or did he...? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Our Lady appeared to him on the uh, 1st of August at midnight. Uh, in the middle of the night, Our Lady appeared to Peter Nolasco and gave him this habit that we still wear till today, the friars. And uh, she appeared to him and asked him to do this work in honor of her son. How beautiful. And then he, was, he consecrated himself at the, at the hands of the Bishop of Barcelona. Father, what, what's the, the major charism of, uh, of your order? What are some of the things that your order is involved with around the world? Well, over the centuries, the order, the friars in particular, we, we've done almost everything, as a mendicant order would do at the request of the bishops of the time. Um, the whole key is to spread and defend the faith. Uh, that's the essence, to spread and defend the faith with our devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and our love of the Eucharist. So that's the essence, to spread and defend the faith in which we give our life for that. Now, there are eight different orders that are, or congregations that are involved with you, yes. and two of them are represented here this evening. And you have to explain to us how these two orders, sisters, <laughs> you're going to have to do some explaining here. How are you all working together? Because that's unusual, isn't it? Uh, it's yeah. rather unique. Um, because the order is so old, uh, around the 1800s or so, we began to have the, the growth of religious sisters, congregations. We had had nuns from the uh, beginning, just like Francis had Claire, uh, St. Peter Nolasco had St. Mary Sevillon, and that's the foundress of our contemplative nuns. But we see in the 19th century, the sisters' congregations start to sprout up with the, the growth and the, the life of the Holy Spirit. And uh, as you said, there's eight different congregations, uh, at least. Uh, Can I ask you, a, it might be a silly question for some people, but for some of you who are watching the show, you might not know the, the answer to this. What is a congregation? Because uh, Protestants watching the show think, well, a congregation is just a, par you know, a parish or a church down the road. What is a congregation? Well, a, a, a congregation, as the church would call it now, it's an institute of religious life. Okay. But it is not the same as a religious order. As, as Father Jacques, you are a religious order, yes. as I am. That means our vows, are, we have solemn vows. Yes. And there's a difference in those vows, not that we do anything against the vows, but uh, the vows are the same. But the, the sisters' congregations have perpetual vows, where ours are solemn vows. And there's a difference, especially with poverty, in the living of poverty, and, and just the antiquity of the religious institute, so to speak, would uh, mm. differentiate. What about your contemplative sisters? Are they still, blue? are they still, are they in Paris or? Uh, our contemplative sisters are in uh, Madrid, in Compostelo, in Seville, yeah. and I, I believe there's one or two cloisters in uh, South America still. Mm. But they are uh, very similar to the Port Clares. They're, you know, cloistered contemplatives. Mm, and they, they pray for the work of the order. Well, it'll be fun to hear from, from the sisters. Uh, Sister Rosemary, tell us a little bit about your congregation and how your congregation came to meet, to work with, <laughs> work with the fathers. Um, Mother Teresa Bach is our foundress. She was a convert from Ruth Lutheran um, religion, and uh, she 
founded our congregation in 1864. Then in 1887, she saw the Mercedarians, they had the same spirit that she was carrying on, that is a redeeming merciful love of Christ, redeeming the youth from everything that keeps away from God. And she worked with the Mercedarians. They were Marian community and as well she was very devoted to Our Lady. Then she thought that we have the same spirit and spiritually and financially and in every way that she could have their support. And she asked the priest, then they helped us to you know, affiliate our congregation to them. And we are working now with them in Florida and all. So your, the, your congregation and, the, and their the yes. order mm -hmm. was originally attracted to one another because you had that common charism yes. of liberating yes. young Amen. people from mm -hmm. that which is keeping them from yes. God. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And they used to liberate before in you know, the prisoners, and now we liberate in you know, as through the centuries the liberating world changes according mm -hmm. to the history and the time, mm -hmm. and now it is totally different than. There's nothing more important than that, I yes. don't think, <laughs> from all of us, you know, liberating, freeing us for anything that can keep us yes. from Jesus. Mm -hmm. From the actual captivities, yeah. which could be ignorance, mm -hmm. and, and sure. that's. Uh, why our congregation is dedicated to the education of children and youth. We are Mercedarian Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, and we were founded by Madre Maria del Refugio Aguilar in Mexico City. That was uh, during the Mexican Revolution in 1910, the 25th of March. And uh, she had a great devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. Um, you know, uh, that, that was the main thing for her at the beginning. And wasn't it just dangerous to do that? Can you imagine? It was very dangerous. She was even, uh, she had to hide, uh, in, in, you know, in the cellars and the, the basements of the houses during the, the revolution and the religious persecution in 1926. Because there, in 1926 in Mexico City, there was uh, a law that forbid uh, the priesthood and the religious vows, so all the religious were expelled, the monasteries and uh, the convents were closed down, and they, even the churches were closed down. What did they do with the religious? The religious were, uh, well, um, our mother foundress uh, hid the sisters and remained with few of them. She started to send the sisters out. The first house uh, that uh, was Cuba, you know, that she founded a house in Cuba, and then from Cuba uh, st started sending sisters to Colombia, to Chile, uh, to it it Spain, and later to Italy. But uh, she sent the novitiate here to the United States, to Oklahoma. And then uh, the main charism is a Eucharistic and Mercedarian. Um, she was uh, very devoted to, to the Eucharist and to the Our Blessed Mother. But um, I should say that she was a widow. She uh, uh, was married because at that time the parents were the ones that chose the, the husband of, of the ladies, the young ladies. And uh, you know, there was a time when the, the, her father told her there is an aunt called Angel Cancino that wants to marry you, and, and she uh, got married, even though she had mixed feelings about it. And mm -hmm. they, they had two children, uh, Angel, Angel, and uh, Refugio Teresa. But she became a widow three years later, and then she was 22 years old, and she got two babies to take care of. She went back to her parents' house, and then she, uh, after two years, the little baby boy died too from upper respiratory infection. And uh, you know, they were not the antibiotics that we find today. So uh, she had a, a little girl, Pusha Teresa, and dedicated herself to educating her and formating her. Later on, she entered the third order of the Franciscans and she became a minister there and a, a mistress of novices. Uh, she was uh, she dedicated herself to the works of mercy, like visiting the poor, the prisoners, giving food to the hungry. And at the same time, she was thinking about her life. She uh, Maria del Refugio was a woman that uh, 
was able to find the God's will among the circumstances of the world. You know, all the, the, the happenings, she had to do a lot of prayer and discernment. She was devoted to the Blessed Sacrament, as I said, and to our Blessed Mother. So she wanted to be a sister, but she wasn't too sure whether she should join a religious order or whether she should start a new order. She prayed a lot, and she was convinced in prayer that uh, what our Lord wanted of her was to start a new order, a new congregation, a religious institute, that dedicated to the teaching of youth and children. She thought that the Eucharist was the main thing in, in the Catholic religion, that there could be no religious, no Christian uh, life without a great devotion to the, to the Blessed Sacrament and a great love to our, our Blessed Mother. She started the congregation in Mexico City uh, her young daughter became a teacher, and uh, they, uh, she opened a school also. The foundation, as I mentioned, was the 25th of March, 1910, in Mexico City. And uh, later on, there were some other girls that joined the congregation, joined the, the, the uh, religious institute. And the first uh, houses were opened, new schools were opened too. But then, as I said, the, the religious persecution came, and she started to send, that that was providential for us, because she started to send the religious to the different parts of the world. Um, before that, in 1922, um, he, well, our congregation was uh, approved by the di as a diocesan institute by the Holy See. And uh, Father Scotty, a Mercedarian priest who was a uh, general for a long time, uh, Master General, was instrumental in getting the approval of our congregation. And so uh, the love that Maria del Refugio had for our Blessed Mother was great, and she saw that our Blessed Mother, under the advocation of mercy, Mm -hmm. I made a lot of favors to her. There were many graces that she had received from her. So she wanted to aggregate the order, to the, our institute to the order of mercy. That's how we, are, we became part of the family, the great family of St. Peter Nolasco. Okay. That aggregation so, came <laughs> on uh, July 22, 22, 1925. And since then we become we, our habit was changed to a white one because it used to be black. And uh, then we began to share in the spiritual graces and the redemptive uh, work, which is uh, especially freeing people from the different captivities, the actual captivities of this world. At one time it was freeing the Muslims from, uh, the, I mean the Christians from the Muslims. That's a, that's a good point right there. What? It used to be freeing Christians from the Muslims, but yes. to, in, in today's world, how are you? How are you living out this uh, idea of liberating, uh, liberating people from that which is keeping them from God? First of all, what is keeping people from God specifically, young people? Because I know you're involved in preschool, yes. about age three up to yes. eighth grade. Mm -hmm. From preschool to eighth grade, what is keeping these young people from God, and how does your charism liberate? Them. The whole aspect of education to to lift them up to 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 lift them up so that they can live their their faith in, in a mature manner and, and preserve their Christian dignity. That that's the key to to give them a firm, sound foundation of the faith that's so essential. And as Sister has mentioned with the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother and, and uh, our our manner of doing it is precisely those two vehicles. So. What do the kids think about the habit? Do they like your habit? The children. Oh, yes. They love it. Because <laughs> yeah, they like, they like a sign. Right. They just run up to you and hug you. And there, there's no fear in our, our parishes of any, uh, yes. any sort of accusations and so forth. The, the sisters are out there, the brothers, the, the priests are with the children playing ball with them in the schoolyard, in the gymnasium. Uh, the little ones come up to you, hug you, and, and mm -hmm. they really feel a sense of family mm -hmm. in the parish with us. And you work together in the, in the, the schools and the parish? I presently don't, but I did for three years with the but sisters. But we work. 
Yes. But uh, the question that you were asking, you know, there are many things that keeps the kids away from God. Especially the te teenagers, they want to make money and they want to own the car and they want to have a good life. You know, they, don't, they think only the present, they don't think about the future and the soul. And the kids, the little ones, they don't know what is right or wrong. They always try to come up with the excuse, oh, I did it because of this. But we are there to help them find out what is sin and what is not sin, what is, you know, not finding the excuses to commit the sin. Because they love the truth. I mean, yes. the children like and, the truth. And they need to be addressed, you know, what is right and wrong. Otherwise, you know, they will never learn. And even some of the kids, that means you're telling my mom does this, my brother does this, then they are sinning. I said, what do you think? After I told you what is a sin, and I asked them back the question instead of me telling them that, yes, they are mm -hmm. sinning. Because, you know, that is a delicate question. probably one of the hardest things yes. that we face when trying to teach them how to live the faith yes. with the, the freedom that God wants us to as his children. And, and when the children of all ages, they'll tell you, well, Father, does that mean my mom and my dad are living in sin? Yes. That what they're doing is wrong? Uh, yes. Tell and them and that, that saddens them deeply because the child, any child, they want, to, they want to do what God wants. They want to do it. Can you tell us about the registration? I think that's wonderful in your school. Oh, yes, the registration with our, okay. our sisters. Um, at least I know for a fact when I was in Cleveland um, at Our Lady Mount Carmel, our pastor there, Father Richard, and the principal, Sister Rosario, they, they take the time and the sacrifice to, to sit down with every parent or every couple of parents at registration time. That you just can't fill out the form and send it in or pay the registration fee, but you have to sit down and meet the pastor and the principal. And at that time, they talk to the parents about the faith. Why aren't you coming to church? Be involved in church, family activities, family mass, and, and even to hand out uh, pamphlets, books, brochures about the catechism and to preserve and to teach the faith in the family. But that have, normally would have a good effect on the parents because they, they like to get involved or do some of them yes, prefer like them. just to send them to school and let you do the work? Exactly. Yes, exactly. there's two kinds of parents, yes. Those who want to get involved, those who doesn't want to get involved. Mm -hmm. And they think in you know, a Catholic schools has to provide them everything, which is good in a way we can, but the parents are the first teachers that they should realize that one. How, yeah. how do parents get involved? How, how, how do you encourage parents to get involved in their children's formation? Well, you, you invite them with the, yes. the different programs the that different do exist. Masses, yes. For instance, the different activities. religious activities, mm -hmm. the, the living rosary, the liturgies, uh, the different associations that, that there are. They've begun different programs, for example, like uh, the, the family nativity set or the family Christmas ornament or the uh, science project where the child has something to do and it's, it's worked with the home and school association so forth and the teachers where it's not just something that the child has to do, but it's something where the parents have to take the time and sit down with their child and work at it. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's a time for family. And mm -hmm. uh, you'd be surprised sometimes you hear from parents, uh, as I yes. did, you know, Father, do you realize this took us two hours? <laughs> I yeah. thought that's great. <laughs> that was the whole, that's the whole key. You spent two hours with your child, you know, mm -hmm. and then the rest, you know, falls into place, God willing. And then when you're teaching them about the faith, what are some of the practical things you teach your children, uh, the, the, the students about genuflection? Or, like, I ran into a boy at the hospital, and uh, he was Catholic, and I said, well, you know, you should receive the Eucharist. He said, what's that? <laughs> you know, they, yes. they, you teach the children evidently about the Eucharist. Well, yes, without a doubt, yes. all of us are involved in, in missions, uh, but uh, the, the greatest missionary territory is right here mm -hmm. in the United States, so it, each yes. one of us and, and where we've been and where I we mean, are. We have, we have liturgy every Friday, and once a month we have a sacrament of reconciliation for the kids. And uh, the sister Bridget, the principal, she tells them we are in a blessed place, we have to be quiet when they make noise. And also she tells them how to get in and how to get out. Before we go leave the church, she asks us to stand up and genuflect. Then she tells class by class to go out you know, respectfully. And all this is a part of the you know, manners and respect for God. Even I taught my students how to greet the parents or anybody that comes inside the classroom. Everybody is shocked. I mean, we need to 
teach the kids how to respect. It's not like, you know, who is she, who is he, that I have to stand up and greet the person. It's like you give the respect and receive That's the beautiful. respect. But don't you think in our Catholic faith, uh, Jeff, you may feel this way too, I bet your father does, you know, many people, many Catholics don't like confession. Yes. It's because somehow when they were trained, mm -hmm. they were never shown the beauty of the sacrament and the priest goes through them, how beautiful it is to confess your sins. And I think that's I mean, so critical. I mean, I'm teaching my students, like if they fight each other, I tell them, you get peace time, you go and talk it over, instead of me getting involved with their things. And I tell them, you have time, you go and sit and talk it over. And after they come up, we are done, sister. And I say, go back to your seat. Now, what do they get together and talk? Like yes, they talk about the problem that oh. they were having. And, I said, and then I brought that argument, like, that's how you talk in the confessional. You tell, and they help each other, and they clear the things. That's um, beautiful. We also have the weekly mass, and the, the parents' mass every month, and the confession every month. And they have a very good preparation for the first penance, mm -hmm. which is as a separate yes, uh, sacrament, mm -hmm. and for the first communion, which was one of the main concerns of our mother foundress, Maria del Refugio, the preparation of children for the first communion. To her, the, the Eucharistic life was the most important thing mm -hmm. for, for uh, the Christian life. And uh, she said that, that the education of the children and youth was entrusted to us that we should teach, especially with uh, our good example, besides telling them, good example, by our word and especially by our prayer. So I think and, you're attractive, sister, both of you, now three of you. You're happy in your vocation right. and you radiate that, really, and you can feel it. And the kids, you know, they'll be attracted to joining. And the young girls I talk to want to wear the habit. It means a lot more than they say habit's not important. But it, it, it's a, it gives you your identity. I wear my habit to the hospital, and many of the Protestants say, thank you for wearing that. I don't yes. know what it is. Oh, you'll always hear it from everyone. Yeah. They always are so keep complimentary. The habit, they say, keep the habit, you look nice. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that, that happened to me at the airport today. You know, the, a man told me, I have to see you in a habit, and thanks for coming. I don't know why he said that, but you know. It, it then you're always witness. A whole sense witnessing. of security and also the presence they should. Sure. For some reason, they, they, they really they recognize that as something. Yeah, I mean, Abby doesn't make a sister or a nun, but it is important to, to give the message that we belong to God. I think that it is a sign. Yeah, that's a sign. Visible sign. Well, when religious started to go without the habit, that was a bad habit to get into it. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, and it was also part of our vow of uh, poverty, you know, the, the, using the wearing of the habit. Because we religious have uh, three vows. We are consecrated to God in, uh, through the vows of uh, poverty, chastity, and obedience. But uh, charity is a big, a big yes. thing. Yes. Well, that's the hardest. With all well, that's the hardest. <laughs> chastity, chastity. But I think charity, uh, charity is the hardest. Well, it's a virtue, and this sure. is one of our characteristic vir virtues that we have. Our, our mother foundress uh, had three virtues that she stressed in her sisters, which were charity, joy, and humility. Wow, she was yes. wonderful. She was uh, a how, how do you communicate charity to a to young people who are living in a world that is very self-centered. Hmm. That's good. That self-giving that they, they see. And I know our friars that are in the parishes and working with the sisters, whether it's in Florida or Buffalo and Cleveland, the, the giving of all of us, uh, there's 26 hours of the day. Mm -hmm. it, it, we're always available. And, and to the sacrifice sometimes of our own uh, time, you know, that we'd like to just, you know, go to your room maybe and relax or, or sit down and have something to eat or a cup of coffee. But if someone comes to the door, especially a child or a teenager who needs help, who wants to talk, uh, either they go to the convent or the, or the rectory. That's the interest and the time that you give, yes. the love that you show to them. I mean, you don't have to tell them that you love them, that they know. They know that they Thank you, sisters. We'll be back in just a minute. Thank you so much. Thank you.
welcome back. We're with Father James, Sister Rosemary, and Sister Maria of the Angels. And Jeff, we're here to uh, discuss. We're talking about that wonderful... Um, oh, the shield. The shield. The shield. Uh, the shield yeah. is actually, uh, it goes back to the 1200s when our, our order received it from the uh, King of Aragon. So the bottom, the bottom half of the shield with the four red bars and the five gold, you see that in many Spanish crests or the Spanish flag. So it's the, the shield of Aragon. And then the, the cross is uh, similar to the Maltese cross. It's the cross that was on top of the high altar in Barcelona where our founder made his, his mm -hmm. vows. And then the crown, the symbol, uh, spiritually, uh, the motherhood and queenship of Our Lady of this yeah. order, and then also the king, King of Aragon, his protection. Okay. And all of our friars wear this. And uh, uh, very ironic that this would be on all of our properties. It was a very medieval thing that you put on all the properties. This way they knew that you belonged to the king, but you also had tax exemption. <laughs> oh, That's such a beautiful Can I have that? <laughs> Sister, what did you say just a minute ago? You had to what? Work hard to get this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. How long was your novitiate? Uh, two years. Two? You were only one year in our mind. No, after we get for prom profession, then uh, in two years you are in every minute you are watched. So you are absurd, and so you have to be very, very I think that's careful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we did our ring with the shield too, but oh. that's when we make our perpetual vows in the middle. Which is uh, it has on one side the monstrance, which is the the where they put the blessed sacrament to explain that we are sisters, mercedarian sisters of the blessed sacrament, and on the other side there is the the mercedarian shield. If I turn it on the back, we have mm -hmm. Our Lady of Mercy in the name of our order in Spanish because it came from Mexico. The shield is very important to us, uh, mm -hmm. especially on our houses, the stationery, uh, you name it, we put it there. Brochures. And it's the brochures, the shield is, is just uh, very, the addresses very important. addresses everywhere. Yes. It's a protection too? Well, it just, it, it stands for everything that we're about. It's the the spiritual, spiritual symbol would be the, the four vows, or the okay. four red bars. So our four vows of chastity, poverty, obedience, but the, the friars, we take the fourth vow to give our life for those Christians who are in danger of losing their faith. We and you're the doing that for the children. Promise. Excuse me, sister. She's doing yes. it for the children, really. No, we take the fourth uh, promise. We make the fourth promise. That is a total dedication. That uh, wherever they send, we have to go. And whatever they ask, we have to do it. That's our fourth promise that we make. Sounds like the Marines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Speaking I mean, every life we have to offer somebody. Speaking, no, speaking of re time. recruiting, who... Uh, I'm sure that all three of your groups are looking for more people. Yes. To, uh, who would be interested in joining you? Who would be interested? Uh, at least in our, our community with the Friars, it, young men uh, from 18 to 40 years of age that are uh, very dedicated to the Blessed Mother, mm. in love with the Eucharist, but have a, 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 just a profound, profound dedication and love for our Holy Father John Paul. Uh, and no, no teasing, no joking about it. You want passionate people. Oh, they're, they're yeah. filled with zeal. Well, you, you're going to make filled them that way when you teach them in school. I mean, they may come. Can you give us any cases like kids you that stay with you? I was a teacher after sixth grade, and I remember the kids. One kid, I loved him the most, but he drove me crazy. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> those, those are the ones. Those are the ones. Those are the ones. <laughs> they they have to have the have religious kids. life for the confidence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they have they have that zeal, and they just have to be directed, you know, the right way. But. Uh, I, I don't well, know. I am a product. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a product of the of the Catholic school because I the school I went to from kindergarten up to the college, the normal school, is the the, the order that I or well, the congregation that I entered, and uh, it, it, that's the case of many of our sisters, though not necessarily so. You know, I, I would say that any young lady that that is interested in in loving God, God and having uh, the desire of ador adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, because we have the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, every single day, even though we teach, we, ha we have the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament every day in silence, and then we also have the rosary and community, and of course the liturgy of, of the hours. But any young lady that 
the times maybe doesn't know how to discern the God's will, but that has an interest, or that uh, would like justice, peace, uh, you know, should ask herself, maybe God is calling me to try that in, in uh, religious life, because sometimes uh, they are expecting a sign, like uh, that was my case, <laughs> that I, it took me about six years to discern my vocation, because all, ever since I was a little girl, I wanted to be a sister. Ever since my first communion, I said I, I will be a sister. That, that's, Why? Why was that? I don't know. I, I think that was part of the preparation for my first communion. It was done so well that I wanted to be entirely uh, for God. My life should be for God ever since I was seven years old. And, and then uh, my mother gave me a book, The Story of a Soul, uh, oh. of St. Teresa of Lisieux. Mm -hmm. I read it and I said, when I turn 15, I will be a sister. But wow. when I was 15, oh, nice. uh, during the Mass of the Quinceañera that, that is used in Mexico City, you know, uh, it dawned on me, well, Maria de Los Angeles wants to be a sister, but what does God want of her? And that took me a long time to decide. Uh, I said, I knew, I have learned that there were three life states, states of life. The married life, which was good. The life without being married, doing God's, the works of mercy, and the life of a sister. I was thinking all the time that being a sister was the best thing in the world. But I wasn't sure that God wanted me a sister. Mm. And, uh, and I didn't get close to anybody to ask for advice, which is one of the things that I would suggest to, to the girls that are interested, to ask a priest to, to find out what the, the God really wants me. And I, I just, it took time for me to decide. I said, well, just in case that God wants me to be a sister, I will become a teacher. Even though my ideals were I, I, I wanted to study biology, but I said, well, in, in the case that God wants me to be a sister, I will be a, a teaching sister, like this, my, the sisters of my school. Oh, then yes. later, I, I became a teacher. I started teaching. In uh, three years, I went to the university. But, but I didn't have any sign from God. I was expecting God to come and tell me, you know, you, you have to be a sister. <laughs> you had a vacation all along. You had it. I, I did. Didn't. Now I, I realize that. That desire that Jesus put. We have an address that the girls want to write. It's um, Mercedarian House. That's um, House of Studies, Monastery of Our Lady of Mercy, 6398 Drexel Road, Philadelphia, PA. Uh, 19151, and the telephone number is 215-879-0594, and the email is at www.orderofmercy.org. That, that's the main... Uh, and we'll, we'll forward it on to the sister, yeah, because and that's, that's our... Because we want, we want young men, too. How did you... <laughs> you're, you're giving our address for the sisters. Right? We love them. You know? <laughs> we need a all few young men, too. More. We're all, <laughs> we're all part of the family. It's all part of the same family. Right? Yeah. How did you, how did you uh, wind up uh, where you are? I, well, I, I, uh, I grew up in a Mercedarian parish. Oh, okay. And it, it, it's, it's very strange because we didn't belong to the parish. We belonged to the diocesan parish down the street. But because the school, the parish school, did not have kindergarten, and my father, God love him, the, between my father and my mother, they just insisted that we had to go, my brother and myself, to Catholic kindergarten wow. before it was a state law. So we went down the street to the Mercedarian parish, and we were only going to be there for a short period of time. We became involved, and I had the friars teaching me in kindergarten, first grade, and so forth with uh, the other teachers Thank that God were there. They insisted. So, <laughs> and we stayed there and uh, they hooked me in. <laughs> we have a phone call. Uh, oh, Mr. Bro I was just thinking of something else. Excuse me. How, okay. about, how about, how did you do your, oh. <laughs> what was your call like? My call, Rosemary? I grew up with the sisters, but I didn't like them. I always stayed away from she them. Was a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> Same with Mother and John. and Mother don't yeah. like the sister. So, whenever they used to come and get me for something to do in the church or something, I always used to hide somewhere. <laughs> and 
Oh, and you're feisty. That's but good. But my seventh grade teacher is the one who inspired me, and she was always kept on telling me, "You will become, you will make a good nun, and you will be a great <laughs> help for the church." I said, "Don't touch me, sister. And I'm, <laughs> I have plans for my life." Then she told me that you know you should pray for vocation, and you have vocation. God wants you. And I said, definitely I would be not the solution. She was a solution and she wanted. Then she told me, told my math teacher to get me, to convert me to become a sister. I said, no. So I was fine then. Then after high school, I didn't think about, about it. Then when I went to college, my sister, oldest sister, she became a Mercedarian. Then I followed her. That's so. very beautiful, you know. Out of yeah. all of her sisters, though, so there's, there's three. We are three, three Mercedarians, and we are five sisters in the family. Well, that's beautiful. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's good. But it was, not, it was the one teacher. It was the one teacher, seventh grade teacher, that really planted that idea, right? Yes. How, how about you, Father? Was it, you, you grew up. Mm -hmm. in, in the church, was there was there one individual or something that somebody said that really started the? It was it was uh, the brothers, the, the one brother that I had, a brother Richard, and he's he's in Florida, and he's in campus ministry now at a, a, a secular college, but uh, his influence and uh, Father Benedict, uh, he's in Florida as well. Oh yes, yes. Father Benedict and, and the other friars that were there at the time, they influenced me. I saw that white habit, you know, as a, as a little kid. And then I didn't think about it growing up as a teenager, but then it, it still struck me. Mm -hmm. Father, we have a call. Hello. Where are you from? I'm from Prospect, Connecticut. Wonderful. Well, what's your question? Well, Father, I'm giving trouble with the TV. Why don't you turn it down in the background there? Okay. Slight okay. delay. <laughs> yeah. um, he mentioned about solemn and perpetual vows and he said there was a difference between the two of them but he wasn't specific specific about it could he be more specific okay um, the vows are the same vows of chastity poverty and obedience however there is a, a slight distinction with poverty uh, solemn vows is total renunciation uh, we sign a will in the last testament so to speak that Everything that I have or anything that I would receive uh, for the rest of my life in solemn vows belongs to the order. I don't have any savings accounts, bank accounts, credit cards in my name. Anything, anything to James Mayer does not exist. It belongs to the order. And if my parents or relatives would leave an inheritance to me, it does not go to me. And I know that it would go directly to the order. Whereas a congregation, when you have perpetual vows, it's something like our simple vows in a, an order where you're allowed to have ownership, you just cannot have administration without permission of the superior. So inheritance and, and so forth can still be yours. You can keep it. However, you cannot administer it at your own will. You'd have to have the permission and the dialogue with your superiors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we, we don't have any bank accounts or credit cards in our hands. Right, right. But, but uh, could give the administration, administration. to somebody else in case right. of an inheritance. Right. You know, looking at religious life from the outside, if you're young, sometimes like when you were young, sister, uh, not that you're not young now, but when you were a grade school student, you know, uh, yes. it looks like religious life can appear cold or it looks like... Um, uh, yes. loveless, and they don't realize that... That's why I want to be different than what I had in grade school. I want to make them laugh and have fun with them, with the kids. I don't want them to be afraid of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that, they can help you. Yeah. Hey, that is true, though, that, that there's a, a, maybe a, a misunderstanding or, or somehow that... Uh, Maybe the that's vows. the type they of formation they had, you know. <coughs> I feel sorry for those sisters, you know. They <laughs> might have a strict formation, whereas I had a different formation. A lot of joy, huh? Yeah, yeah, and we enjoyed every minute of our formation in Italy. And well, I every did. minute now. You, 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 <laughs> yeah. And your sister's going to remember that. Yes. <laughs> they, I mean, they were, yeah. we, had, we had a good formation in our shit, yes. After that, we started our other <laughs> We have another call. Hello, where are you from? Hello? Yes, I'm from Houston, Texas. Yes, wonderful. What's your question? Uh, you yes, first, I just want to say thank you for answering God's call 
uh, from all of you, you know, I mean, that you answer that call. Uh, it really helps us, and EWTN, uh, we love EWTN here. My question is, how would you, sisters and, and fathers, how would you explain, I have a first communion class, and how would you explain purgatory to a first, you know, the, the first communion class in a way that they would understand it, and also the consequence of sin, because they are so little, you know, they, they, I don't think they can see the consequence of sin as we see it when we are older. Okay. Everybody's doing I, I love teaching purgatory. That's, yeah. I, 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 wow. Well, that's refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is refreshing because, you know, uh, really there, there is heaven and hell. And, and purgatory is, you know, we sh a soul rejoices in purgatory because they know they're going to go to heaven. That's true. And I, I used to teach them in, in Cleveland, the, the church, Our Lady Mount Carmel, it's a small church. And, but the vestibule is just uh, pathetic. Hmm. It, it's smaller than this area right here. And, you know, the bathrooms are very close, and there's not a lot of ventilation. And I used to tell the pastor, you know, it just is horrible. And, I would, and the children knew that the, the vestibule smells. So I would explain to them that heaven is like the church building. The entire roof of the church, the whole building, is heaven. But purgatory is the vestibule. <laughs> and, and then once you go through those front doors, then you see the beauty of all the art and the presence of God. And you, but you can see through the glass doors that there's something bright on the other side of these doors. You know, you can see in, but you can't see it clearly. That's wonderful. Really. Well, I thought it helped. You know? <laughs> I imagine you get you're getting good at. At teaching complex uh, topics to children, <laughs> breaking them yeah. down into it, 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 well, it's a it's a good fruit of meditation. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I wanted to say that uh, we uh, are blessed to belong to the Mercedarian family, in uh, namely at Our Lady of Mount Carmel in Cleveland, where we have a brother who is a full-time teaching uh, brother who teaches. Uh, it's, he's a homeroom teacher for eighth grade, but he teaches sixth, seventh, and eighth. And we have Father Michael Donovan, uh, uh, who teaches religion. So there are many questions that the children can address directly to Father, or um, maybe uh, he's available for counseling right after school. I have seen him many times calling some of the student, uh, students that have questions, and that uh, he could clarify it. And of course, our sisters are very intent in teaching religion also, uh, the, all the, the staff members, the faculty, the lay people have to fulfill certain number of courses to be certified by the diocese in order mm -hmm. to teach the religion classes. So, uh, you know, that, that's an important thing, but we are blessed to, to have a pastor, Father Richard Rush, who is so involved in the school, mm -hmm. as Father was mentioning at the beginning, and a brother, a full-time teacher brother, and uh, a priest that teaches religion every day. You know what's in interesting in your vocation? You have really are contemplative and active. Yes. You have yes. that deep prayer yes. line, and everybody, you know, uh, I feel, what? loves the Eucharist in the sense that's the center of our church. But the second part of that question was very interesting. What do you feel are the effects of sin? Yes. What would you tell them? I tell them, you know, like kids I teach, I had to prepare the, my kids for the First Communion and even Sacrament of Penance. Mostly I tell them the progressor is waiting time and we can help the worldly people and worldly people help us. That's what I tell them mm -hmm. because, and also I tell them, though, you know, many times this is what they say, when they, oh, he was peaceful when he died. I'm sure he went to, straight to heaven. But we are not sure about that. That's true. I tell the kids, we are not sure. That's why we pray for all the deceased people and we don't know where they are, in heaven or in purgatory or in the other place where we don't want to be. <laughs> uh, what, what is that, you, excuse me, you just said about the, uh, the worldly people teach you, teach that you something about the worldly people. Worldly people, we, the people, pray for those who are in purgatory and those who are in purgatory, they cannot help themselves, they will be praying for in us. The world. Yes. Yes. And that's what I tell them. In Without a doubt, the consequences yes. of sin, though, you know, that, yes. that to, to love the world, enjoy the world, but also be aware that there are things in this world which do lead us away from God. And to teach that to the little ones, it's difficult yes. because they're being brought up in a society and time that 
Uh -huh. But when I tell them, they, they understand. And also they will have the reality of what is heaven and purgatory and hell. Children they understand this. more yes. than we think. Yes, yes. yes. they do. Jeff, Jeff has three children. Yeah. I do. I have, girl, <laughs> I have three uh, beautiful girls, 16, 5, and 3. Yeah. So they're all over the board. And I, I value a Catholic education. That's something that I think we need to support. Mm -hmm. And um, I know as a parent, I want my children to go to a school where, where the, the teachers take their faith very seriously. Mm -hmm. But like the Apostle Paul, uh, they don't want to be disqualified themselves. They want to walk the talk themselves. And I think there, there's nothing quite as damaging as to uh, say this is what we believe, but then they don't see anyone around living that. Yeah. And sooner or later, ch kids are going to come to the conclusion that this, this doesn't apply to my life yes. anyway. And I think that all the way from the habits to what you're wearing to the life that you live, you are modeling the faith. You're modeling what the church teaches. And I think that that's a, a, when kids come into daily contact with clergy, with religious, who are living the faith, you know, there's a power there. There's yeah. a great freedom from the faith. And that's, that's, that's the whole point of that. You have charism. an inner urgency with this, too. I mean, you're really forming souls, which is, we only have about one minute left. Could you just, something that would really, you'd like to leave with our, our, our listeners and our viewers? <laughs> to, to be free is to live the faith, to live in, live in Christ, you know, and not to be ashamed of it. And that, that means a life of responsibility. And there are consequences of our actions, but if we continue to follow in the footsteps of Christ and be close to His Blessed Mother, that freedom is guaranteed. And that leads us to, to eternity. And that's what fits in with what Jesus said. He said, you, you know the truth, which is what you're teaching, exactly. and the truth will set so you free. Yeah, that's yes. right. And I would add that our mother founders, Maria de Refugio, said, you came not to be uh, just good, you, you have to be holy. And I think there were the, the words that Mother Angelica mentioned at the beginning of the program. That's beautiful, sisters. Thank you for joining us. Thank that's you. Wonderful. Thank you. You're passionate people. You're passionate. That's what we need. You know, it's obvious you've fallen in love with Jesus, and that's what's so wonderful. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Jeff. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in.